Ford Motor Company, maker of Ford, Thunderbird, Edsel, Mercury, Lincoln, Lincoln Continental, and the new Ford Falcon presents Leonard Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic in Venice. This performance of the overture to Mozart's opera, The Marriage of Figaro, is our most affectionate postcard to all our friends back in America from this glorious city of Venice. We're having a wonderful time. We wish you were here. Regards to all. But why Mozart? Why are we American musicians playing Austrian music in an Italian theater? I think you'll see why instantly if you just look around this breathtaking jewel of an opera house known as La Fenice. It's the embodiment of what's usually thought of as 18th century beauty. Just look at the aristocratic elegance of these proportions, the intimacy of the grandeur, which is of course the most aristocratic element of all, the lightness and airiness of the structure, the delicate gaiety of the paintings, 
the refined ornamentation of the scroll work, the precise, tasteful extravagance of it all. When we see all this, what is it that we hear? What is the first sound in our inner ear? Mozart, of course, who represents to most of us all elegance, wit, daintiness, intimacy, and all the rest of the things we heard in that Marriage of Figaro overture. But if this were all, then Mozart would have remained always an artist of his time, a Rococo genius who captured his epoch in notes. But then so did some other composers named Stamitz and Dittersdorf capture their epoch. And so did a lot of other names you may never even have heard of, including several sons of old Johann Sebastian Bach, who left behind them what had come to be regarded at the time as Papa's stuffy style with its hard-working fugues and fuddy-duddy counterpoint. These composers had embarked on this charming new garden path of late 18th century prettiness, easy, refined, tuneful, witty, gay music for the let em eat cake nobility. But today they are mostly just admired names, while Mozart is and always will be not a name, but the divine Mozart, a heavenly spirit who arrived in this world, remained in it some 30 odd years, and then left it new, enriched, and blessed by his visit. What is it that makes the difference? Only this, that Mozart's genius was a universal one, like that of all great artists. He captured not only the feel and smell and essence of his age, but also the spirit of man, man of all ages, man in all the subtleties of his desire, searching and struggle. When we were in Moscow, the great Pasternak said to me, in spite of everything, I am full of joy. My art exists as a record of the tragedy of human existence. It is nourished by tragedy. And my art is all my joy. And so it is with our greatest creative spirits, and so it was with Mozart too, which may come as something of a surprise to some of you who have the habit of equating Mozart with aristocratic delicacy and nothing much more. How many people I have heard dismiss him as Tinkley, a musical snuffbox composer of music like this. And those people say, we don't want any of this mincing drawing room stuff. Give me guts in music. Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, the tragic, the monumental. Well, that kind of talk can mean only one thing. They don't know Mozart. No one can have listened to Mozart, listened hard with both ears, without experiencing what Pasternak called the tragedy of human existence. Just listen to these few bars from his last sonata. could easily be by Beethoven, Beethoven in one of his typically tragic rages. It has all the power and the attack of a real giant. There is even in this same sonata a Beethoven-esque mystery, a certain veiled wonder and awe, which is one of Mozart's most moving qualities.
feel that Hamlet-like melancholy, that tragic essence, even encased as it is in an 18th century frame. But Mozart's music is constantly escaping from its frame because it's bigger than its frame. No matter how clearly every bar of it is labeled 1779 or 1784, the music is essentially timeless. It's classical music by a great romantic, and it's eternally modern music by a great classicist. Now, in order to understand how Mozart's music escapes from this frame, we must first understand what the frame is, that 18th century encasement in which the music finds itself. Try to think of this 18th century period as you know it from reading and paintings and, well, yes, even from the movies. We know it as an era of manners, of conformism, at least among the gentry, a time of great formality, with a huge amount of attention being paid to style, to courtly gesture, to modes of dress, to elegance of behavior, to stately forms of address and the like. Now this naturally caused a vast set of patterns to arise, to which it was absolutely necessary for a cultured lady or gentleman to adhere. This was true not only of social patterns, but also of musical ones, since music always reflects its own time. And that's why 18th century music is so filled with patterns and formulas amounting almost to clichés. For instance, take cadences. As you know, cadences are the harmonic progressions by which phrases of music are brought to a close, much as the comma, the colon, and the period bring word phrases to some kind of resting point. Now, if you should go through the complete works of Mozart some rainy afternoon, you will find to your horror the same identical cadence patterns used with incredible repetitiveness in work after work, movement after movement, even phrase after phrase. These cadences are almost no longer music. They seem to have become only points of punctuation. For example, here's a typical Mozartian cadence from the slow movement of his Prague Symphony. Now that's a charming little cadence, but if you should count up the number of times Mozart has employed that identical sequence of notes, then you'd be tempted to accuse him of simply repeating himself. No modern composer would ever permit himself this kind of stock-in-trade repetition. But what does it mean? That Mozart was played out? That he lacked inventiveness? Well, certainly not. We know that invention was Mozart's middle name. It means only that he was a composer of his time, that his vocabulary was necessarily delimited by the conventions of his time. And the wonder is, not that he used all those conventional formulas, but that using them, he was able to create music of such amazing variety. Now listen to that same cadential formula as it appears in another rhythm in his G major piano concerto. Exactly the same notes, but different music. Now then, later in the same concerto, when he has to repeat this cadence, instead of repeating it literally, he varies it this way. And then you can go all through his works and find that same cadence in all kinds of different disguises, like this, for instance. Or here's another way. this way. You see, it's always the same cadence, but varied each time to acquire a new meaning of its own, whether delicate or playful or more serious or introspective, but a meaning which is exactly right for the particular passage of music it is punctuating. And thus, it has ceased to be a formula at all. That is the power of Mozart. Now, here's another case of formula composing. If we examine Mozart's accompaniment figures, the supports for his melodies, that is, we find again a series of repeated clichés. This, for instance. 
This in the trade is known as the Alberti bass, which is perhaps the most overworked fixture in all 18th century music. We associate it usually with that tinkly snuff box we spoke of before. But over and over again, we can find Mozart using that same figuration so that it is transformed by the sheer beauty of his melodic invention above it. As for example, in the second movement of that same tinkly sonata, where the delicate intricacy of the melodic line makes the Alberti accompaniment seem new and lovely. You see what I mean? Or listen to this surprisingly romantic theme from his G major piano concerto, which is replete with Tchaikovskyan sighs and longings, and yet it all rides over that same simple-minded Alberti bass. But even more impressive is what happens to that theme when Mozart develops it later on, like this. been taken clear out of the 18th century. The theme has now acquired a new force, an almost Beethovenesque intensity, and without yielding up for a moment that doodle-doodle left hand. You can see again how Mozart has transcended the limitations of the formula by the power and depth of his own invention. So we begin to discern what this frame is made up of. Cadence formulas, Accompaniment formulas like Alberti basses or figurations like this in the left hand. You know this one. Or triplet figures like this. Now this last figure is a case in point. I don't know if you're familiar with the great C major piano concerto, but its second movement begins with just those triplets. But when an unbelievable melodic line begins to soar above it, that mechanical little accompaniment becomes in itself a thing of rare beauty, especially orchestrated as it is with delicious pizzicatos in the basses and subtle woodwind reinforcements. Just listen to it. I find it one of the special treasures of all musical history. an extraordinary experience that melody is. Timeless, ageless, and yet it rests on a rigid, formal, 18th century pedestal. 
But perhaps the most characteristic element of all in this period stylization is the whole business of 18th century ornamentation, the trills and turns and shakes and roulades that adorn the melodies of this period, just as a scroll work doodad adorns a cornice of this Fenice theater. It amounts almost to a compulsion. The 18th century composer, committed as he was to prettiness and aristocratic frippery, couldn't just write a tune and leave it alone. He had to decorate it with elegant icing. Now just imagine how untypical that famous tinkly melody would sound without its ornamental mordant or turn. It's not the same thing at all, is it? Kind of dumb. But with the ornament placed on that next to the last note, it suddenly becomes our old 18th century friend. Now Mozart, that angelic voice, could take even a doodad like that and make great and emotional music with it. Now here's a theme from one of his violin sonatas, a passionate, strong theme full of pulsing drive. And yet it is actually built out of that same frilly ornament. Can you imagine how that music would sound without that decorative frill? It would sound like this. All wrong, bare and ordinary. It's the ornament itself that makes the difference. So it turns out that Mozart has actually used the ornament for deep musical values and not only for 18th century icing. But these ornaments aren't limited only to turns like that, or to trills, or to grace notes. They run even to whole scale passages and complex filigree. For instance, in a highly ornate cadenza, Mozart may write what is basically this note pattern. but he adorns it in this dashing way. Now what a difference that makes, not only because of that brilliant descending scale, but also because it plunges the end of the phrase into a register two octaves lower, which gives it a much more meaningful and moving quality. Well, such are some of the ways in which Mozart constantly moves above and beyond his period, bursting out of his formulistic frame and even using those very formulas in his own way to produce music of surprising originality and power. It is a power which enabled him to produce works of towering strength, far indeed from the musical snuff box in which people so often like to lock him up. Take one of his minuets, for instance. What could be more anti-powerful than a dainty minuet? And yet, there stands that muscular minuet in the G minor symphony, utterly transformed through the strength and ingenuity of its rhythms into a movement of rich pathos and grandeur. <clears throat> some dainty minuet, while the rhythmic variety and surprises in those few bars could be typical of a 20th century composer, so bold and new do they sound. And as for power, only think of the great Jupiter symphony, in particular, the strength of that contrapuntal last movement, which looks back to Bach for its massive fugal complexity, its virility and architectural thrust. <coughs>
tremendous power. Or think of the dramatic power generated by the operatic Mozart, who could project human character through music to an uncanny degree, like this sudden outburst in Don Giovanni, which looks ahead across a whole century to Verdi. <laughs> That could be straight out of Aida, so strong is its dramatic impetus. Or listen to this passage later on in the same opera, that chilling moment when the ghostly statue comes to supper. This is music of such depth and power, it is almost Wagnerian in its quality. <laughs> Pretty strange music to come out of an 18th century snuff box. But remember, this is not Dittersdorf, this is Mozart. And Mozart's music transcends his period. It looks back to Bach and forward to Beethoven and Wagner, to Chopin and Schubert and Verdi and even to Mahler. Mozart is all music. There is nothing you can ask for music that he cannot supply. I wish we could perform for you enough of Mozart's music to give you the range of his emotional palette, such works as the C minor mass, the Requiem, Così fan tutte, the E flat symphony, the G minor quintet, and so on. But this being obviously impossible, we are going to play for you part of one of his greatest piano concertos, and I think you will find all these qualities we've been speaking about concentrated in this one work. We are going to play two movements, the second and the third movements, of Mozart's marvelous G major piano concerto. Now, if I absolutely had to name my all-time favorite piece of music, I think probably I would vote for this andante we are going to hear now. This is Mozart at the peak of his lyric powers, combining serenity, melancholy, and tragic intensity in one great lyrical improvisation. You will hear the tranquility of a Schubert lead, the filigree of a Chopin, the brooding of a Mahler. And I would like you to notice particularly in this movement the beauty of its orchestration. This concerto is orchestrally rather modest, even within the already limited frame of the 18th century orchestra. For instance, it employs neither drums, nor trumpets, nor clarinets. And yet, wait till you hear the wonders Mozart produces with three solo woodwind instruments blending like three glorious voices in an operatic trio, or the rich pathos he can create with a little inner melody played by the violas. Again, even in his orchestration, Mozart has transcended his time.
And now we emerge from the contemplation and mystery of that almost sacred andante into the brilliant light of the finale. Brilliance, that's the word for this marvelous Rococo set of variations. The whole movement is bathed in a glitter that could have come only from the 18th century, from that age of light, lightness, and enlightenment. It is a perfect product of the age of reason, witty, objective, graceful, delicious. And yet over it all hovers that greater spirit which is Mozart's, the spirit of compassion, of universal love, even of suffering, a spirit which knows no age, which belongs to all the ages.